welcome to the latest episode of the Be Movie Club. I'm your host, Kevin. This week we'll be discussing the 1982 science fiction classic, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, starring, of course, William Shatner, Leonard Nimoy, the whole gang, in addition to Ricardo Montalban, and, shockingly, Kirstie Alley. For those of you joining us for the first time, the Bee Movie Club, what we like to do is I'll pick a movie, I'll post it online, you can go home, watch it at your leisure, and then uh, respond to me, your favorite scenes, favorite quotes, anything else you'd like to get off your chest about this particular movie, questions, comments, and we'll talk about it on the show. You can reach me on our page on Facebook, Original Be Movie Club. Don't be fooled by those imitators or people who came before me. Um, you can also reach me on uh, YouTube. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to like our Facebook page while you're at it. If you want to reach me more immediately, you can reach me at um, Twitter, at KD9575. So, Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. In this movie, we've got uh, <laughs> we've got James Kirk. He's getting a little older. He's an admiral now, uh, you know, and he's feeling kind of like you know what? It's not as much fun to be an admiral as it was to be captain. To get my hands dirty, to get out there, you know, boldly going, to get my drift. Um, meanwhile, <laughs> Chekhov is now first officer of the Starship Reliant, and they are out looking for a planet to test the Genesis device, this mysterious device which is supposed to take a, a dead world, like a moon for example, and turn it into a lush, fertile place where people could live, essentially. And they go and visit uh, SETI Alpha 6, which all their sensors are telling them is a dead world, and they get there and they discover a spaceship has crashed there. In some ways, very similar to Alien, the plot of Alien, okay? Um, and Chekhov notices that the name of the starship is the Botany Bay. His wheels are turning. For all those true Trekkies out there who really were in, was into the original Star Trek uh, TV series, you might remember Botany Bay. Um, Botany Bay... Uh, is a group of people from the from the 90s, the 1990s, who are kind of like supermen and women. Like they were genetically engineered to be smarter, faster, and stronger. Now we met these guys uh, in an episode of Star Trek called Space Seed, where we learned that uh, Khan, who is the leader of these, this group of people. Khan Noonien Singh, a Sikh warrior um, who actually at one time controlled like a quarter of the earth essentially, um, fleeing from people who basically overthrew them. Him and his followers went into a spaceship, went into cryostasis because they didn't have faster than light travel back then, as we know, um, for hundreds of years, okay? So they caused some havoc anyway. At the end of that show, uh, Captain Kirk says, you know what, I'm going to leave you on this, on this planet. That way, you know, even though you were trying to take over the ship, even though you tried to murder me, I'm going to basically maroon you on this planet, give you a chance at survival. You can create your own civilization, blah, blah, blah. So evidently what we learn, at the risk of giving away too much of the plot, uh, something horrible happened to that planet. It didn't work out the way they thought. So now Khan, as he's referred to only, uh, has a bone to pick with Captain Kirk. So now that he's got the spaceship, uh, he's able to uh, basically he uses these creatures to crawl in the ears of Chekhov and his captain, Captain Terrell, played by Paul Winfield, who you've seen a thousand times in a thousand things. Uh, these worms crawl in your ear and make you like basically follow his commands. So now he, he commandeers the Reliant, goes after Captain Kirk, I don't want to spoil everything, but there's epic battles, a lot of good things going on. Uh, before I tell you any more about it, I'm going to welcome my special guest, Crystal. You remember her? A few weeks ago we went over American Werewolf in London. She's going to share her personal insights in this movie as a true Trekker, not to be confused with Trekkies, if you will. So let's hear it for Crystal. 
Favorite scenes from Wrath of Khan? Probably uh, number one, the scene with the SETI eels being placed into Chekhov's and uh, Terrell's ears. Always a significant gross factor. Um, that's number two. The absolute number one favorite scene of all time in any Star Trek movie for me, and I'm a big Star Trek fan, is uh, Spock sacrificing himself. The out needs of the the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few, and um, you know, just it's a really touching scene. I mean, you had you know 15, 20 years of history between Kirk and Spock at that time, and it was just heartbreaking. It was heartbreaking and and moving. Star Trek Into Darkness, which I saw for the second time last night. Um, really does not compare to Star Trek II Wrath of Khan because on the alternate reality timeline that they're in now, it's actually more of a play on the original uh, series episode Space Seed where Khan is originally found. Um, so it, it's not, you know, 15, 20 years later after he's marooned. It's, you know, before Kirk even gets his five-year mission uh, whereas they were in Into Darkness, I don't want to give anything away, but Khan is found by somebody else, and that's kind of what you know starts his whole storyline. So it's like it's sort of like in some in some way, even though the timelines have been changed, they were just two people that were destined to meet and be foes. So they still end up crossing each other's path, but it's in no way reminiscent of uh, Star Trek II, Wrath of Khan, it's a little more closely related to um, Bad Seed. There are similarities, though, with regards to um, the warp core being FUBAR, and, you know, there's possibly some self-sacrifice to save the Enterprise. Um, there is the classic... Uh, Con moment, which uh, which I loved, and um, but yeah, it's a great villain. My kind of uh, you know little trifle with it is that um, Khan Noonien Singh is supposed to be of Indian descent. He's supposed to be a Sikh, and uh, Benedict Cumberbatch is whiter than white. So yeah, that's that was a little. But he's a great villain great villain. He's marvelous. So uh, Ricardo Montalban's portrayal of Khan is uh, regarded in sci-fi circles as one of the best uh, villains of all time, one of the best uh, portrayals of a villain. And Ricardo Montalban, it's probably one of his best uh, film performances, the way he commands the screen in that character. He's charming, but he's evil. And um, What's interesting is he was 61 when he shot the film, and lots of people have wondered if that was a prosthetic chest that he's wearing, because the man has pecs like the Hulk, but that was actually all him. That was not prosthetics. What's on? Um, I really love what J.J. Abrams is doing with the new series, um, and uh, I... I'm sort of a big dork in the fact that The Voyage Home is one of my favorite Star Trek movies. Double dumbass on you. And, uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I'm, I was hoping that somebody would text me because you would hear my, uh, my cell phone text is the sound of a Star Trek communicator because that's how big of a nerd I am. So yeah, anytime you want to do any more Trek films, I'm your girl. Call me up. And we're back. Thank you very much, Crystal. For those of you who have a hankering to be on the show, if there's a particular movie that we're discussing, or if you have any movie suggestions about a movie you'd like to discuss, let me know. I might be able to discuss it with you over Skype. And I might put you on the show. So there you go. I'm ready to open up the doors to talent wherever I find it. So please, the line forms the left. Step right up, take a number. Thank you very much. What else can I tell you about this movie? As we know, uh, the original Star Trek motion picture was kind of a modest success. Uh, it had picked up from the cult following from the original TV series. Um, but it was way over budget, and even now people look back on it as being kind of boring. A little too 2001 Space Odyssey, a little too bizarre. Not enough of that meat and potatoes we like from our Star Trek. So uh, 
the Paramount executives actually kicked Gene Roddenberry, the famous creator, off this project and made him an executive producer, consulting producer, which is to say he really didn't have any say about this movie. A different guy came in and said, you know what, we need a villain. That's one of the big problems. Um, studio hired this guy who had previously worked on primarily TV to be the director and basically the auteur of this movie. He wrote, rewrote the script, uh, which centered around this character, little known villain from the first season of Star Trek, um, who, I mean, he's great, great. So they were like, started writing this up, he's going to be the main villain. At one point there was a different script rattling around out there with like two aliens from another dimension. Gene Roddenberry's original idea for the second Star Trek movie was that the Klingons go back in time to stop Kennedy's assassination and the very convoluted. So they said, no thanks, we're going to do this our way. The director had actually never seen Star Trek before, uh, you know, so it wasn't, he didn't feel a certain reverence to the original source material. He's like, I'm going to take what I want um, and kind of add my own flavor to it. So they're writing up the script, Wrath of Khan, Revenge of Khan, The Vengeance of Khan. They weren't sure which way they wanted to go because at the same time, uh, Return of the Jedi was out, which at the time was going to be called Revenge of the Jedi. So they didn't want Star Trek Re Revenge of Khan right up against, you know, Star Wars Re Revenge of the Jedi. So they settled on Wrath. As they're writing this, they realize, hey, no one's spoken to Ricardo Montalban about being in this movie. Luckily, they went to him, and he was he was in. He's like, count me in. You know, he loved the script. He loved the character so much. He actually took less money to do this, which helped them because they were trying to stay way, way, way under budget. As we know, uh, <laughs> at this point, Ricardo Montalban was famous for being Mr. Rourke, our mysterious host each week on Fantasy Island. His, he's a, his name is Mr. Rourke. Does he seem very Irish to you? But again, does he seem like a Sikh? I mean, his, his name's Khan Noonien Singh. Essentially, if you have an accent, whatever's clever, you can play Irish, you can play a Sikh, you can play whatever. Um, he said, count me in. One thing that people don't remember is that uh, he is like Mr. Science Fiction. Obviously, he was in Wrath of Khan. He also was Fantasy Island, which was kind of science fiction, if you really want to get down to it. But he was also in not one, but two of the Planet of the Apes movies. He was in uh, Conquest of the Planet of the Apes. He was in Escape from the Planet of the Apes. He's Mr. Sci-Fi. So he said, sure, count me in. He actually had some trouble getting back into the character. He had to go back and rewatch that original episode to really kind of get into it. Because he he's been the affable Mr. Rourke, you know. Welcome to Fantasy Island. And uh, being, you know, let me make your fantasies come through. I don't know why I sound like Dracula, but that's what he was going for. Uh, but, you know, that character, the original Khan, was very charismatic and powerful, and that's how he was able to seduce some of the crew members back in that original episode. Anyway, he watched the original episode many, many times and really got into it. Um, Wrath of Khan, to this day, is considered the gold standard of all Star Trek movies. It's great. People who don't even like Star Trek movies love Wrath of Khan. Um, and it is. I mean, it, it deals with this kind of... Uh, kind of primal force, has a real villain, you know, obviously Star Wars has Darth Vader. This is the one where it's actually like a powerful charismatic presence rather than just kind of a random Klingon say, yeah, whatever, we'll just have a Klingon be the villain for this one. So, what are you going to do? Some other things you might know, might want to know, or might not want to know, frankly, about Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan. Chekhov is the one who discovers the ship on a city Alpha 5 or 6, I don't remember. Um, he's the one who sees Khan, recognizes him. Oh no, it's Khan, it's Khan. Small problem. They first met Khan during season one of Star Trek, the original series. Chekhov didn't join the crew of Star Trek until season two. So they never actually met. The director later admitted this was a mistake on his part. And frankly, the casual viewers who haven't seen Space Seed wouldn't know the difference anyway. That's just my opinion. And they're right. Uh, the thing I think is uh, kind of interesting is that uh, Leonard Nimoy had no interest in making another Star Trek movie at this point. And the only way they could get him to do it is by saying, you know what, we'll kill you off. And so word got out, they were going to kill off Spock, and fans were flipping out. So it's kind of a trickaroo. What they did was is they had the Kobayashi Maru scene, 
at the beginning, which was kind of a, uh, it was a fake scene. It was a test to see how Lieutenant Savick did uh, when faced with an unwinnable situation. Spock gets killed. Oh, no! Oh. But again, like I said, he wasn't really killed. Ha ha ha, we fooled you. But at the end of the movie, as we all know, spoiler alert, uh, Spock does die, uh, basically rescuing the ship. The power core is about to explode. He has to do some, I don't know, he does something. He sacrifices himself. Bye-bye, Spock. Of course, we all know he came back in Star Trek Three: The Search for Spock. Hope that's not a big spoiler, uh, considering that they made like five more movies after this with Spock in it. So, anyway, I think that's kind of interesting. So there you are. <laughs> Currently, this movie has a 91% fresh, certified fresh, on Rotten Tomatoes. So if you haven't seen it lately, I highly recommend it. Rush out. Check it out. It is still streaming instantly on Netflix. I love it. Next week, we're going to go back to the horror genre. The Dead Zone, based upon a, a book by Stephen King, of the same name, starring Christopher Walken. Get ready for a lot of horrible Christopher Walken impressions, because that's what I'm going to be bringing next week, okay? He's in this. You've got Martin Sheen is in this. I mean, it's an all-star cast. What are you going to do? It is streaming instantly on Netflix, so check it out. Send me your questions, comments, favorite scenes, favorite quotes. As I said, you can reach me on our page on Facebook. Don't forget to like it. Uh, you can reach me on our YouTube page. Don't forget to subscribe. It's free. And you can contact me and tweet me on Twitter at KD9575. And don't forget to spread the word, won't you? As you know, I end every episode with a totally out of context quote. And here it is. Galloping around the cosmos is a game for the young doctor. It's my horrible Captain Kirk impression. So there you go. Thank you for joining us next week. The Dead Zone with Christopher Walken. Be well.